Hey, what's up, everybody? It is Doug. I'm here with my co-host, Josh Rhodes. Josh, you want to say what's up? Hey, everybody. How's it going today? Hey, we are here with another episode of Pull and Trigger, and today we're going to talk about clods and shaft trucks, sort of the differences, and we're going to keep this a high-level discussion. Um, the idea we keep this high level, just talk about some of the general differences between clods and shaft trucks. And in a future episode or future episodes, we're actually going to do deep dives on shaft truck chassis and clod buster chassis and really talk about some of the, the nitty gritty. But we're going to keep this pretty high level for the hobbyist who really wonders, you know, should I build a shaft truck or should I build a clod buster or not even build one or if you should just, you know, own one because a lot of these are available and ready to run now. So, um, Josh, let's talk about the clod buster. Before we get into the racing stuff, though, let's just talk about the clod in general, the differences from a shaft truck. You want to talk about the uh, motor on axle setup? Oh, yeah, we can definitely talk about that. Um, when you get, you're, whenever you get a clod buster, you're going to notice a drastic difference in it and an SMT-10. Out of the box, SMT-10 is probably the way to go uh, as far as a cheap alternative to a race truck. Clod Buster is more of somebody like your hobbyist guy that's going to pull one of these out of the box, take the axles, and completely modify everything on it to get it to be a race ready truck the big thing that i've always had i've always harped on is that once you do get that clod buster race ready it is to me a superior truck the reason i say that is is it's much more tunable than a shaft truck the clod buster you can actually tune your front motor to pull a little bit more than your rear motor with an moa setup that's something that a lot of people don't utilize, but that's something that they should utilize because when you come out of a corner, you're a lot more stable with a front motor pulling a little more than the rear in a clod buster. That's the big advantage to a clod buster. The big advantage to the shaft truck, though, I'll let you go ahead and say. Yeah, so I mean, well, there's a couple things. For one, you have to be ready to modify some clod buster components because if you build one um, box stock, they can be fun box stock to bum, bum around on or bum around mm -hmm. in, but... The steering is atrocious. They have a center steer with tons of slop, and you put the servo in the middle. You have to get aftermarket steering. So yeah, um, right you have to get it behind the axle setup. Yep. You also have to get in there and shave the inside of your knuckles to make sure that you're getting as much throw as you possibly can. Uh, and there are a plethora of clodbuster parts out there from different companies. Um, I myself use Sutton Motorsports. I don't know what all the rest of the Trigger King guys use, but as far as a behind the axle setup. That's probably one of the best ones on the market to get, and it'll help you get your throw right in the in the front of the truck. Whereas yeah. the shaft trucks, I've noticed, you don't have to really do anything out of the box with them. Especially the Lowe's LMT. So, yeah. you know, with the axial. So let's talk about shaft trucks in general. Just um, just so you know, and if we have some younger viewers, the Clod Buster has a motor on axle setup. It. There is no shaft. There's no center transmission. The transmission is built into each axle. Um, a shaft drive truck typically is a center transmission with drive shafts that distributes power to your front and rear. It's like a traditional real world setup. So your most popular trucks are going to be the axial S&P 10 or axial base trucks. Um, uh, the Rotten Apple truck here behind me, Rotten Apple 2, that's a, a, a ACRC Havoc chassis, but it uses axial guts. Um, mm -hmm. And now, and what really changes the discussion is the Lowe's LMT. And as Josh was talking about the steering, um, both of those trucks have good steering out of the box where you don't have to be shaving knuckles. The LMT has amazing steering out of the box. That was one of the engineering feats that they did. You can really turn those things tight. The problem yeah, it's was almost 90 degrees. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like a joking, almost like a tractor, how you can steer it. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing with the, X, the SMT 10 or other shaft modified ones sometimes you see if you don't have enough adept, like the uh, the offset if you don't have enough offset sometimes you'll have the tire at full throw bang into the four link bar and you actually have to tune your steering down to avoid that the lmt does not have that issue now it depends what four link bar you use and your servo and a bunch of other things uh, there's variables in that but sometimes with the s t 10 as it sits in stock form you can bang that front four link the uh, tra uh, trailing arm i guess is what they are um, yeah, we can so, talk about four links actually right now. There's a, yeah. two different types of suspension that you can use on these trucks. You can axle mount it with a clod buster. It's going to be a little more difficult. You've got to get some things to where you can actually mount your shock to the axle, or you can do a trailing arm style suspension, which is uh, the lower links that have there the aluminum with the split in the middle and the holes through them to where you can bolt your shock anywhere you want to and pretty much move your shock from outside of the chassis 
to inside on the chassis as well. And that's what most of the ACRC Chaos trucks use, as well as, uh, say, your ZRP Diablos or anything out there as far as aftermarket Clodbuster stuff goes. Most you can do that on the SMT 10 trucks as well. Yeah, I know that uh, one of the things people harped on most with the SMT 10 is people arguing, and, and rightfully so, that an SMT 10 is not like it has a trailing arm set up. Real full size monster trucks do not use trailing arms, they use shocks on axle. And I know that's a big um, issue that some people have, and fine, I get it. Uh, normally, it seems like it's on most setups that for an RC truck is the superior way tunability and handling wise is to mount the shocks to the trailing arms and have a trailing arm set up. However, it's not always the case. And the LMT is another engineering feat, managed to actually keep a scale kind of setup where the shock is mounted from the chassis directly onto the axle. And that works well. So again, the LMT is really where a lot of this recently, there's a lot of developments in this discussion, the Claudverse uh, Shafty, because you know, just what I've found, uh, a Claude, as Josh said, um, you can, they're faster. I mean, ultimately you've got two motors versus one. So the power in a Claude can be just totally insane. Even if you're talking about a retro truck with 27 mm -hmm. turn motors, a retro truck with 27 turn motors still has those motors on the axle. So you're gonna get a little, it's gonna be torquier than somebody who were to build an old style truck with a single transmission and a scale style, right? And um, the other thing is torque twist. We haven't even talked about torque twist. Yeah, you know, and that's what you're gonna get with a lot of the axial based vehicles is a lot of torque twist. You mm -hmm. need a really strong sway bar on those vehicles. Whereas a Clodbuster, you can afford a little bit lighter of a sway bar. Exactly. And again, the LMT changes this by having the transmission that is, uh, I mean, it's totally different. It's got a dip in the middle, the motor's mounted sideways it alleviates a lot of that issue and it has stiff sway bars too. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not that, I don't wanna make it sound like the axial stuff is necessarily a negative because I love running the axial stuff. I, my trucks are all tuned well, I can run really well with them, but there's just, I guess there's knowledge you have to know with each of them. And I would say the, you need the most knowledge for a clod to get it to work right. They're just, they're complicated. If you don't- they are. Know, uh, a lot of people have always asked, well, how long did it take you to get a really good race setup on a Claw Buster? Not lying, still learning. It's been 12 years in this hobby, and uh, I really didn't get a good setup. Let's see, I started in 09. I didn't really get a decent racing setup on the truck till 2013, 2014, when I felt really comfortable with the truck. And that's pretty much when Trigger King started, mm -hmm. and I've been evolving since then. Yeah, I remember when you had the, the ZRP stuff i think at first right or was it i forget what exactly um you were running i had a tr i had a cpe terminator that's right okay ZRP, terminator truck that's right a zrp diablo as well the diablo was the number one race truck the terminator i still have those chassis plates uh somewhere somewhere in, somewhere in here they broke it bigfoot for the terminator but i had that truck for a really long time and that was kind of like my experimental truck for uh, a higher end racing chassis like the diablo what was different on both of those trucks was the position in the sway bar was the main difference. The ZRP had it coming all the way out of the bottom of the chassis to the axle, whereas uh, it's more like uh, the CPE Terminator is more like what you see on a, a Chaos truck where it's out of the uh, out of the bottom of the chassis. Or excuse me, no, I take that back. CPE was also out of the bottom, but it mounted to the lower trailing arm. Yeah. It, so. Um... Also, just in talking about that, I had a Terminator, and just in, when you're talking about the learning curve with the Clod, we're talking racing Clods at the moment here. We're not talking like retro style. Mm -hmm. It's easier to get a handle on the retro trucks, but um, race Clods, I tried a Terminator. I had a CP Terminator. That's the Crawford chassis, which is a, it was a good piece, and I even had, um, when ACRC, when Bob started that, I had one of the original Chaos trucks, and that one handled pretty good, but I still could never really get the setup right that I wanted because it's just... Again, you've got two motors to tune, usually two ESCs. Um, we haven't even talked about the price. A race oh, quad yeah. is very expensive, especially when you start, you, you got to double your motors, you double all your electronics. Um, you can run the same battery, just use a Y connector. But um, you also, I mean, it depends what you want to do. But if you get into machined clod parts, which are small batch runs normally of things, you're really talking some dough. And I know yeah, there are guys out there that uh, not even kidding have probably close to 2,500 to 3,000 in their Clodbuster setups. Just and a lot of those guys are guys that are trying to reinvent the wheel and putting their shocks up on top of the chassis versus down on the sides where most guys run them. They're, they're trying different things 
on it. And I commend them for it if they've got the money to blow. But, or the machine time. Yeah, or the machine time to blow, exactly. Yeah, they're um, and some of those parts that look trick. I mean, you're talking like the HESI machine stuff, right? And, yeah, I'm talking HESI machining. I'm talking some stuff I've seen come out of the Bari camp with a lot of his yeah, guys. Yeah. Or even Travis, Travis uh, Sutton, Sutton Motorsports, and Ross Hinshaw, RH Designs. Those guys are always jacking around with different components. They're tinkering with everything they can, and they they like to push the rules quite a bit too. Or even look at you know J Concepts, what they do with Shapeways and everything. That's not uh-huh. the parts, but um, that's kind of the fun part though with the Claude still is you you are getting more of the cookie cutter stuff with the shaft trucks, which is an advantage because shaft trucks you can build a competitive, consistent shaft truck. I think much cheaper and much easier and replacement parts are easier to get blah 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 the clod stuff is pretty cool though because a custom clod in a lot of ways is a custom rc vehicle still they're just they don't it's not mass produced necessarily even the um just the aftermarket chassis you're not going into the average hobby shop and buying a clod chassis a race chassis you have to get online you have to sort of know somebody and uh, it's it's interesting that way. And the clot's kind of always been like that for the most part. Yeah, I, my, I, one thing I've always said is if you're going to get into a race clod setup, you got to know a guy that knows this guy that knows that guy that probably knows this other guy that really knows how to machine these parts. Yep. Uh, thankfully, it's, it's a little like when I first started, none of this stuff was really on the Internet. It was message boards that you would mm-hmm. have to message back and forth on. Now, with the advent of Facebook, you can find just about anybody that you need really quickly, with the exception of a few people that still do stuff for Claude Busters that are old school guys like uh, Team Thunder Tech. Yeah, yeah. They're, and they were one of the famous people, you know, back in the day, really, who were kind of leading the charge with a lot of this stuff. I think, can't you still buy Claude Zillas? I've heard that. Yeah, you can still buy Claude Zillas. I see them mostly on eBay. Yeah, and they still make them, though, right? Like, you can... I believe that they're still producing them. Yeah. Which is, you know, for you young, younger guys that might not mean anything, but for you, you know, even the old timers who didn't race monster trucks, I remember reading RC car action back in the day. And in the back, you know, the little ads, you'd see like the ESP Clodzilla three or four, you know, the, the ad in the back. And um, I remember when uh, my younger brother in the late nineties ordered one from the hobby shop. Somehow, I guess they had just distribution somewhere you could get them. And um, how cool that was. And even when it showed up at the hobby shop, the people behind the counter were like, whoa, what is this? It was sort of this rare, you know, underground thing. And it's it's not so much anymore, as mm-hmm. you're saying, but it's still a clod is, it's, it just goes to that, the whole knowledge base thing, right? Like a clod, I think it takes a lot more tribal knowledge to get it to work right. Because so many people, and I, I include myself in this, when I raced a clod, I got very frustrated trying to tune both motors and to get both tuned right and then you know a clod isn't that easy to work on if you it's not like you can just yank the transmission out I, it's not that they're that tough i suppose but if you crack a gear in a clod it's not like in a shaft truck or an smt10 where you just a couple screws the axles out you make the swap that's it or you pull the transmission out real quick and that's it you got to take the whole axle apart and see what's in there and then even gears it's tougher to find that's why most people use the stock gears because it's hard to get machined gears for them yeah that's the that's the biggest issue with uh race clod busters is there's not much of an option out there as far as gearing goes uh i use always use an aluminum counter gear and for those that are paying attention that's the big fat second gear in there it's not the spider gear it's the actual big fat second gear in there that's hooked to your spur gear um i used to run those uh, and i've even stopped running those now because once you you can blow bearings apart inside of a clod axle and not even realize it. And I've done that quite a few times using those particular uh, gears. And when you do, you kind of get some pieces stuck inside of there that you can never really get out. And it's gross. Like you just said. So scattering, you get a scattering, like in a real vehicle, if you have something explode bearings and you get a scattered bearing, you basically can screw up everything in there. And especially Mm -hmm. if you get it packed with grease, you get those little shards in everything and it basically you just got to clean the whole thing out the housing and just almost redo it yeah it's it's so much easier just to yank gear and throw in a new one instead of pulling that out having to clean especially on a race day yeah most of us with a clod even my retro trucks you know which are retro trucks pretty much are all clods you have the crunchy gears coming off the jump and then a lot of times you got guys 
crunchy gears and you just, a lot of guys don't change them out until they really need to. It's common in a clod to just lose a tooth or two and just keep going. And just yeah. not, not pulling It's it very anymore. common in a clod. What else is common is, and I've had this happen quite a few days in the early trigger King as well as just uh, maybe last year as well, where you break an axle tube on a clod buster, which is something that you don't see very much on a shaft driven truck. Uh, the tube. axle tube, what I'm talking about is where your axle shaft connects into the gearbox. There's two big ears on it where you can bolt your knuckle on. I'll either break the top or I'll break the bottom off every, at least once or twice a season and usually in the worst possible times. <laughs> and uh, I've had to fix them uh, with basically zip ties to keep going because there's just not enough time in between rounds of racing to change out and put a brand new axle tube on, even with a quick change gear set like you would get from Crawford. Yeah, so that's the thing. What you have to actually take the rear apart. Or, well, I say the rear because a lot of times it's the rear that breaks, but um, I actually got away from clods for a long time because I was so tired of snapping tubes at a race. And I, I went, a, you know, this is a couple of years ago, but I went around like, or I, I had a run of breaking tubes to where every event I would just break them constantly. And it was so frustrating. I remember I did the same thing. I had zip ties on hand to try and just get by until the end of an event because it's just, it's a pain to change them out. And that's the disadvantage. And I guess there's one, you know, big thing here. I think that when we talk clod versus shaft truck, that when you're racing them against each other, like we do in our classes, shaft trucks and clods are both legal. And both of them really duke it out pretty well. The only time I think the clods have a massive advantage is in our judged freestyle, because then the power on tap, you can just do a lot more crazy stuff in a clod. Yeah, but even even now with uh, the advent of stuff from, say, what you're seeing from Losi, as well as Freestyle RC, look at Isaac's trucks. I'll, throw, I'll put out Isaac Ankrum's name here. He's won our Freestyle Championship a few times with Rockstar. RC. Yeah, and yep. Rockstar. That stuff is just, it's becoming better. Whereas in the early days of Trigger King Freestyle, it was Clodbuster or Bust, basically. Now, with the advent of all the stuff that you're seeing coming along from custom machinists like Freestyle RC or what you're seeing from the low C LMTs that are coming out with the ability to have that center diff in there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think Freestyle this season is going to be very interesting to watch because you're going to see guys out there with claw busters. You're going to see guys out there with LMTs. You're going to see guys out there with SMTs. It's going to be very, very interesting to see which one's superior, but I'm leaning towards those low C trucks on it. I think they're going to be great just because. Well, I guess in a freestyle, you can't really repair them. But the nice part is once parts are available, it looks like they're going to be pretty easy to repair. But yeah, the Lozies have, um, I think in freestyle, they're going to be fun. I, I never freestyle. I personally, I, I haven't because I don't like to tear my trucks up. And especially at the end of the day, I'm normally kind of fried from trying to run the event. But I am going to freestyle my LMT. I'm, I'm looking forward to freestyling again this year because with the LMT, I feel like it's going to be able to dish it, you know, take the abuse for the most part and it'd be easy enough to fix. Uh, but one of the big things that when you race against each other, and we found this out, the and this is typical always, but usually the clods have the more power, and you'll see that they they'll run faster just typically, or at least they get up to speed faster because they've got all that power, instant torque, right? And there's no torque twist or anything where the shaft trucks take a minute to spool up. However, the shaft trucks normally outturn the clods all day. You guys have to do a lot, to, you know, like trim knuckles or put different knuckles on um, to try and get more steering throw. The shaft trucks, especially like the LMT, just they turn on a dime. But even the SMT-10 does. Uh, I think it turns pretty well, and that's that's been their advantage. The other thing with a shaft truck too is if you're talking like a brush class, like sport mod, you also have a lot more gearing options with a with a shaft truck because you have a bunch of ready-made spurs and pinions on the market you can kind of experiment again with the clod you're pretty limited in... yeah the clod you're basically limited to opinion gear yeah you yeah you can't be swapping spurs you know i and excuse me if somebody makes a different tooth spur out there for the clod maybe they do but for the most part what you have in the gearbox you have to do the pinion and to even be able to change the pinion you have to get an aftermarket pinion mount because there's only two holes for the one stock pinion. So to even really change your gearing, you already have yeah, to. You need adjustable motor mounts. I actually have one up here. Give me one sec. I'll show you. This is what you have to bolt onto your truck. If I can find what I did with it. I just moved it. Here it is. Yeah, you have to bolt one of these mm -hmm. on the front of your motor to be able to slide your motor to make a bigger pinion work. This is what I have on the Wildfoot truck in the background because it's a sport mod and you're allowed to mess with the gearing a little bit in a sport mod truck. Uh, there's, I believe, 16 tooth pinions on that truck and you still have to modify the gearbox slightly even with these just to be able to get that bigger pinion in yeah and, and 
again, that's something a lot of people don't understand. So for a lot of people, they just kind of stick with the stock gearing on the quad. So in a race, the shorter races, typically you have, they're a little bit more skewed towards the quad if there's not a lot of turning and everything. The more turning courses typically kind of, at least it makes it a little more even. We, I don't know about you, Josh, but I don't really feel in racing one necessarily has an advantage unless it's a really short drag race or something where the power does matter to where the quad would have the advantage, but we normally don't do a real short drag race. And in mod, we have so much power in the mod trucks that really. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Uh, honestly, I think they both perform about the same right now uh, in each class. Um, now, back in the day when we first started, I would have looked at a shaft truck and kind of laughed at it. I mean, that, that happened for a, a, lot, a lot of years. Uh, there was a reason back in the NRC TPA where there was a separate shaft driven class with TXT trucks versus a quad class, which was basically what was your pro mod class. Uh, the reason being behind that is, is nobody ever thought that the shaft truck could keep up with the pro mod quad trucks. Now out of the box with the SMT 10, when it came in, that changed a little bit when people started modifying these trucks and made them to where they could handle the abuse of a clod. And they honestly, I didn't start taking shaft trucks seriously until Michael Arndt started racing with us. Yeah. He's well, he's, he, again, he really can't, he's a good, he's a great racer. He hasn't raced with us in a while. Um, shout out to Michael. If he watches this, I know we mentioned him a show or two ago and he messaged me and said, Hey, thanks for the, the heads up. Why don't you race with us again, Michael? Yeah. Come um, on, man. <laughs> yeah, the, he was, I remember that. And then really just in general, the SMT 10 started the influx of it. And now I'm just curious to see this year when you've got the LMT that's battling with it, you're going to have, the pro mod's going to be fun because you're going to have the LMTs, you're going to have the modified SMT 10s, which is basically what I run. And then you're going to have the, uh, you know, the old standby, right? The, the clods and mm -hmm. even in freestyle too, it'll be interesting to see what truck is better to the way I view it. I love I love the variety because to me, in drag racing, the pro modified class is one of the most popular because you've got turbo cars can race against nitrous cars can race against supercharged cars and each one has a little bit of a difference, and that's kind of where I view these type of trucks because the uh, LMT is a shaft drive but it's not your normal shaft drive. It's a center diff and even has the cush drive and everything on it, so it's not it's different. Well, it's funny you mentioned drag racing because that's a very good way to put this with a clod buster it's instant power mm -hmm. and that's what drag racers really love is instant power to supercharge exactly like having a blown car and you know, with the actual uh smt10 it's not necessarily like that it's a little bit of a slower leave with an smt10 versus a clod buster the clod you're where you're losing power or where you're losing with a clod is having so much power to the tires you have to really know how to control that and that's where you end up losing races to smts they're a more consistent vehicle off the line and throughout the racetrack as far as i'm concerned um but i still love i still love the clod because i've got all that power right there at my fingertip whenever i need it yeah and we haven't even talked about the weight so the lmt is a heavy oh, yeah. truck the lmt is a heavy truck it's around 10 pounds so this one's kind of different but in general, the SMT-10 is a featherweight and the clods are heavy. A mod mm -hmm. clod, I'm always surprised, Josh, whenever you let me drive yours, like I've filled in for you a couple times with racing. And those mod clods, man, with the twin ESCs and you get the machine parts and some of the other stuff, those are heavy RC trucks where an SMT-10, even a modified SMT-10 is a featherweight. Like there's just not, there's not much weight on them. So, and it, they, it makes them handle different too. A clod to me, not only can it have the disadvantage of like the turning radius sometimes, but they want to push when they're really heavy like that. And mm -hmm. the LMT, the, I'm sorry, the, like the SMT 10 style trucks, they're lighter and you don't really have to get on the binders and they kind of just want to turn easier, I found. Uh, all Part of that is the fact dirt. that they have so much more throw than either one of these trucks. Mm -hmm. uh, LMT, when, it, when you look at a stock LMT's turning radius, it's it's pretty astonishing to look at compared to other trucks. And that's one thing I'd like to get up here. Maybe I'll do a photo later today of my pro mod clod, my uh, havoc chassis truck and the LMT all sitting straight up. And you can kind of see how much more turning radius each of these have on these modified trucks. It's, it's unreal how much more steering you get with an LMT. Yeah. And, and, you know, we didn't really talk about retro today. Most guys that build the old school trucks, you'll use a clod buster. And oh yeah. I actually just uh, improved some steering on my regulator truck 
uh, J Concepts has available some shape waste parts for that. Uh, if you're like me, though, you can't you can't afford it. <laughs> Have you we used got, those new knuckles? Do what? Have you used those new knuckles? I saw J Concept release those I have, knuckles. Yeah. I have not. Uh, what I did was I went and I shaved the uh, lower control arm and shaved a bunch, basically shaved a ton of stuff to where I could get about an eighth of an inch more throw. It was like a full day's worth of work to get an eighth of an inch. And an eighth of an inch is an eighth of an inch is pretty significant. I know on my trucks, um, it's not as big of a deal, I should say, if you have four wheel steer. And a lot of retro trucks do have four wheel steer, but most of us that race them, we lock out the the rear steer for the most part, or only put it at like you know, 10, five or ten percent. Yeah, I gonna I, say maybe. 10%. I have, but I have I have it both both ways with both trucks. The regulator is a front steer only because it's such a short wheelbase that you really don't need the rear steering. Mm -hmm. But you still need a pretty good cut as far as your front steering goes if you're going to have an advantage on tighter turning courses. Yeah. The grandma digger truck that I have has rear steering on it. And honestly, I prefer not having the rear steering with the uh, regulator truck to anything. The rear steer, is, it's, it's always had an issue. And even with a strong servo in the back, your rear tires are still wanting to kind of do this when you land. Whereas if you don't have a moving at all, you're dead straight. Most of the time, that's a huge advantage too. just a four wheel steer is cool. It's cool to have on a retro truck more for like a fun thing. Like, hey, it's four wheel steer. But yes, even if you lock a lot of that steering out, you're going to get play because it's not locked. And it's a lot of races are lost in retro from a snaking. That's what we call it snaking uh, to where a truck starts to, to snake with that rear steer on it. Mm -hmm. And it, it works better for the most part if you don't have it. But as Josh says, if you're not going to have the rear steer, you really got to start doing some things to get throw in the front. Because if you had a stock Tamiya Cloudbuster front setup that was locked out, it would take forever to turn. And then, you know, you just can't turn tight. So you do, you have to shave the knuckles down. You have to shave the ladder bars. Anything you can do to get more throw. Now, J Concepts, I know I mentioned these Shapeway parts and Josh did too. They actually have some, I think, knuckles and aftermarket tubes and everything. That Yeah, and that stuff is phenomenal. It really is. They put a lot of work into it. I'm not downgrading that stuff at all. If you want to go out and get that stuff, please feel free to do so because it's going to help your retro truck quite a bit. But if you want to save a little bit of money, do what I did. Just shave your your arms down and shave, uh, shave your knuckles and you're good to go as far as I'm concerned. What the disadvantage is, though, to doing what I'm doing is you're weakening those parts. You're weakening that plastic, whereas the Shapeway say, stuff yeah. is already designed for that. Yeah, you lose the structural integrity. And the more that you start to, to do that, the weaker it gets. Now, on a retro truck, it's not as huge of a deal because the speeds aren't there and normally the impact isn't. But you still, if you keep lopping stuff off, can snap stuff, especially with a retro truck, which is heavy, you hit something at a weird angle or something and it, it can snap. So um, in retro truck here, if you see behind, that's my uh, rotten apple, my old, the rotten old apple truck. That's a... Uh, Sutton Motorsports, but it's a clod for the most part, a clod buster black edition. Um, Josh, I guess anything else kind of you want to just end on here? We've kept this discussion pretty general, hopefully to help people. Again, we're going to go more in depth here soon on these topics, like individual chassis, weaknesses, strengths, and all that. Is there anything you kind of want to wrap up here with? Uh, well, uh, as far as the biggest question that I always get is people wanting to know, wait, what's the best option out of the box? I've been a clod guy for 12 plus years. I will tell you every single time out of the box is you want to probably go with either. I want to, I always usually say the SMT 10, but now with the advent of the LMT, if you want more power, the way, I've, the way I describe it, if you want to get out into the, like get your feet wet and racing, SMT 10, minimal modifications to the truck and you're on the racetrack. If you want to just go out of the box straight to the wall with something, Get the LMT. They're out of the box. There's readily available parts for them. You want if you want to go the Cloudbuster route, I can send you the the ten paragraphs of stuff that you're gonna need to start to get the Cloudbuster stuff started. Yeah, I I would echo. That's kind of my wrap up too. The shaft trucks are just easier to get into, and a lot of guys too, you know, want the actual more scale setup with a, a center drive transmission. The LMT is an easy recommendation if you can get one. I know the back orders, you know, this, but they're going to be available. That, that truck's going to be around forever. The LMT or the SMT-10, they're both solid platforms. You're going to need to do a little work on the SMT-10, of course, but it's cheaper. So you're going to be around the same price. 
they're just a lot simpler. Again, the quads are more for the advanced hobbyist. And you really feel for the guys who want to get into a quad who they're also noobs to the hobby as well. That's a double whammy. And we've had yeah, some of that, that's uh, that's one of the biggest problems that we had as far as keeping people within the hobby back in the day when we didn't have these readily available vehicles out there. We had guys that would go out and buy clawed busters. They would break and then you'd never see them again. And that truck would be to somebody else's truck before the next the next race. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny, too, because you would hear. Well, even even for me, like I remember looking at the NRCTPA stuff and like magazines back in the day. And at the time, you know, there's no trigger game, there's no anything and not really in, in the Midwest here around us in St. Louis. And I remember looking and not even knowing where to start, but I wanted those monster trucks. They look cool. And that was the problem even a few years ago still was, oh, hey, that looks cool. Or even all the, the guys like on our YouTube comments who'd be like, oh, those are cool. How do I how do I get started in that? Well, or how much is one of those? Yeah. And both of those are very hard to answer questions like the, OK, get a cloud buster. Well, yeah, you get a cloud buster, you're not going to be doing what we're doing in these videos. You have to do all this other stuff. And again, like you're saying, it takes a like a dissertation that you have to write. And you still have to know how to use all this. If you're a newbie, you would have no clue like how to wire your motors, especially, you know, you got to make them run backwards. And it's just clouds take more knowledge. I'm not saying it's impossible. Of course, they're they're easy enough to learn. But just now, especially with like an SMT 10 or, or the LMT, you just get into it real easy. Clods are still cool though. Again, that's not to say they're not. A high performing clod, like the ceiling I think is highest on a clod as you're saying. Yeah, I believe so as well. Uh, if you want to modify a clod buster, feel free to go out and do it. They are some fun vehicles to drive when you get them completely modified and you get them right. Uh, the same though can be said though for your SMT 10 style chassis. The same can be said for the LNT out of the box. And you don't really have to do much to modify either of those to get them race ready whereas a clawed buster you're looking at a while <laughs> to get it race ready let's let's be honest here i know that there's a modicum of pride if you have a mod clod it's kind of a special almost like a status symbol in the hobby because not only does it say well one i guess you've got the money to do it but it also they have the knowledge especially i don't know i just remember it used to be, and I guess it still is the same way. Whenever I used to go, you know, I used to race RC cars, standard RC cars, buggies and stuff. And every once in a while, somebody would come up with a mod clod and you set it down and everybody kind of comes over in awe of it. And I guess really though, that's still what it is with RC monster trucks, the solid axle stuff, even now that they're readily available. Whenever you bring one out, it still kind of has that feeling of like a real monster truck almost, yeah, I guess. It's like a real monster truck whenever it pulls into a car dealership. People off the side of the road are like, what is that? Yeah, and it's still in the hobby. That's what's cool with the solid axle trucks. They still do have that effect, but especially a mod cloud because there's an air of like magic behind it to where even a longtime hobbyist will look at it and be like, how do you have that thing wired up? Because again, a mod cloud, you got wires running everywhere and there's just a lot mechanically going on. And it's that's it's one of the cool things. So if you want to do it, go for it. And again, you always have a resource here and you can always email us, ask us questions or something. Um, and with that, I guess we can kind of just get out of here. I will say uh, before we do, uh, Josh can plug himself here and what he's got going on. I want to say um, you can check me out, bigsquidrc.com. I write the Monster Truck Madness column that goes up there weekly. I'm on their weekly live show typically. And um, the other thing I'd say is for next week on here, we're going to do a Q&A episode. Josh and I want to do a Q&A episode. We've got some that are sort of all over the place topic wise. So we're just going to do a Q&A episode next. If you've got any kind of RC monster truck question, or even a full-size monster truck question, I don't know, um, leave it below and we'll we'll ask it and uh, we'll read it and we'll answer it next week on air. So Josh, what do you got? Any new plug? Well, I got, uh, as always, the Instagram pages at Josh Dig Roads, as well as at Retro MT Review, uh, Retro Monster Truck Review on Facebook and Josh Roads RC Racing on Facebook as well. This week's guest is the Retro Monster Truck Review is Colby Marshall. We're talking Houston 1987 USHRA. And the following week, we've got a really deep dive into Richmond 1990 with Chris Parrish that I think everybody's going to really love. Richmond, um, and if you, again, or excuse I'll, me, like, Richmond, 1989. Sorry, I said it wrong. That's with the infield, right? The famous infield. The uh, that's wall. on Pitt Road. Yes. Okay. We're one, but we're one lane had the uh, the wall, right? Both lanes had the wall at Richmond. Okay. I, and I know what happened. Myrtle Beach. They raced with one truck down Pitt Road and one truck in the actual infield. Richmond, very tight. Pit walls on either side. It it made for some interesting racing. And I covered both. And in that episode, we're going to cover 
uh, Tough Tracks as well as the Power Tracks episodes. Okay, cool. See what's if, different. If you haven't, guys, check out Josh's podcast. Again, I was on one of the first episodes. We talked about Freedom Hall, but I enjoy as a longtime monster truck nerd uh, who loves all these old races. I like to listen to the episodes every week, too, that Josh puts up with them. A different guest and it talks about he talks about classic monster truck races and they're all they're available on youtube and they're well worth the watch on youtube and he's talking about the big races some of the important races where some milestones happen so big plug there for josh you can check out the link here in our bio um, below here if you look i'll have the link to the retro monster truck review on there so josh thank you very much guys load up those questions below here and we will read them on air next week and uh, we will see you guys soon. Thanks for watching.